I want to hear your story about 21st century. Oh, absolutely. Um, I moved to Nashville in 1972, and uh, I was a student at Fisk, Fisk University. That's where Derek and I met initially. Uh, first time that I was in Nashville Records was uh, with a project with uh, Isaac Douglas and the Royal Gospel Singers. Are you familiar yeah. with the Royal Gospel Singers in Nashville? That's right. Because I was the uh, musician for the group. Isaac Douglas had come out to one of our concerts and uh, he says, I want to sing with that group. I want them to back me up on my next project. And I think if you look it up, it's on a, uh, a uh, album, Pattern My Life. On yep. one side is uh, his songs uh, solo with us singing, like Someday. And uh, there's, a, there's another song that we sang behind him on. So when uh, initially when I, when I arrived in Nashville, about, uh, I'd say, September, maybe, uh, Dr. Jones came to my room at Fisk looking for a musician wow. because a guy by the name of Waco Thomas, who uh, was affiliated with um, um, Franklin um, Church, New Bethel in Detroit, was leaving. Okay. And uh, he was completing his uh, studies there. So they definitely needed someone and uh, someone that they wanted to train. That was the first probably, that was the first professional gospel group that I played for. Okay. Uh, and uh, since that time, uh, after we finished with the uh, recording of, with Isaac of um, Someday, uh, uh, I, been, I was in the corner with uh, Shannon Williams and the 21st Century Singers who were uh, an integral part of Nashville Records. That's right. Right. So, That's right. And um, they asked if I would be interested in also playing for them because I was also playing for the Royals. So I said, sure, absolutely. And uh, Shannon, um, we did uh, Huntsville, Alabama, local concerts in the area, of course, uh, the War Memorial. You know, that was a, um, uh, like a landmark for, yes. for most possible artists at that time. Yes. Yeah, most came to the War Memorial. So uh, after a couple of years of uh, working with both Isaac and, and the 21st Century Singers at that time, uh, the group consisted of uh, Lula, Charles, and Johnny. But there were also two other, um, well, I can't remember uh, the drummer's name and the bass player's name. And then I don't know, I know one is still living. I'm not certain of the other. Okay. Uh, and there was also a gentleman by the name of Jerome McClinton. And Jerome McClinton was from Connecticut. He is the cousin, just happened to be the cousin of Kurt Carr. Wow. Strange, funny thing. So, yep. so the interesting thing about that is that I left uh, Nashville in 76. And uh, I moved back to, um, um, to East St. Louis, Illinois, where I stayed until uh, 80. And when I arrived in um, uh, San Francisco, California, I discovered maybe a year or two later that Jerome was playing for Reverend Cleveland and I was playing for Helen J. H. Stevens of uh, Northern California. Yes. And, and so that was a very interesting because both were known in their areas as trailblazers. Yes. Of course, you know, Reverend Cleveland was trailblazer by all means. Yes. And I was a Cleve follower, you know, for many, 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 many years. Uh, even uh, in Nashville, my first time with him was with the BCNM Mass Choir, where he would come and be their special guest. Wow. So uh, my, um, my, my first impression of the 21st century singers, I'd never heard a man uh, of Johnny Whitaker sing as high. And with such color, his color matched that of Sarah Jordan Powell.
Yes. I think that may have been uh, one of uh, one of the persons that he emulated the most. And he had a long reputation for, for directing the BCNM Mass Choir. Right. You know, and uh, also uh, being with uh, part of the Johnson Ensemble as well. That's where um, um, a Johnson Ensemble uh, uh, Everett comes from, the Johnson Ensemble. That's we right. initially met the, those other persons who did the background work. I was not familiar with any of those persons. The only persons that I was familiar with in terms of studio was John Hasten and Charles, Charles Barnett. And uh, uh, I met uh, John Hasen. Uh, he came in for the sessions with Isaac Douglas at, initially because of the Brooklyn, New York connection. And then Charles uh, came in because of his connection with uh, Reverend Cleveland. So one thing that I learned from both of them was they helped me to develop my style of playing and uh, also how to accompany. Because I was, you know, I was 17, 18 years old, you know, I, I knew very little, uh, particularly about uh, uh, how to actually be a gospel player. And they really helped me tremendously, along with Gary Jones, who was the organist at that time. He was, he was a ball of fun. Yes, Gary Jones was something else. <laughs> well, and an incredible writer. And an incredible writer. Yeah. I think it's I, I, when I interviewed Dr. Jones, that's one of the things I talked about was how his compositions were um, so timeless. I mean, they carried Dr. Jones right. really for 30 years. Right, like it ain't easy, those songs, like it ain't easy. Uh, You'll step right in on time. Yeah, right, right, right. Just, just incredible, just yes. so incredible. Um, and a lot of fun. You know, and during those days, you know, Bobby was a party animal, you know. Okay. You know, at 1107, that's what it was noted for. It was a, a place of partying and having a great time. And he knew how to host and uh, make people feel comfortable. Wow. I met quite a few people just at his home. You know, I, I met the great Oprah Winfrey. Wow. Dr. Jones' home, you know, she was young, and very talented. Wow. And, and I don't know how, I managed to save a program from the 70s with both of our names on it. Wow. I know. So I've got some incredible uh, memorabilia to share real soon. Well, I should ask, too, when since you brought, brought up Dr. Jones, yes. um, did you get to encounter, I'm sure you did, um, the New Life Singers during that time? Well, uh, this was before the New Life Singers. At that time, Bobby Jones had a, uh, a choir called the Love Train. That's right. That's right. And, and they performed, uh, I think it was every fourth Sunday at uh, Pilgrim Emanuel Baptist Church in South Nashville. Uh, the preacher um, was Michael Graves at that time. Okay. He went on to found the uh, probably one of the first mega churches in Nashville, Temple now. Temple, yes, that's right. Right, and I was when I was the uh, musician for the young adult choir there at that time. Okay. I was the first person that he asked to uh, um, move with him to the next level, but I, I had other plans in mind. I wanted to move to California, so I had to graciously, you know, uh, rescind or say no. I I'm going to do something else. Um, but uh, he went on to greatness, absolutely, and I. And uh, the the War Memorial served. Uh, I did a lot of concerts there with Dr. Jones and Love Train. Uh, wow. Uh, Shirley Caesar, uh, uh, the Barrett sisters, the twins. Um, I remember a lot of those concerts. Wow. So I got a first time to meet. First time to meet those artists. Yes. That was my first time meeting those artists. Well, and can you, I'm curious about too, going out, I'm, I'm going I'm to backtrack to the 21st century singers. I'm curious about, can you talk a little bit about, and I didn't tell you I was going to ask about this because I didn't know until you said it. Um, I'm curious about how audiences responded to 21st century singers. Well, 20, 21st century singers, uh, they always had a great response. 
um, they were noted for also singing. We were noted for singing in clubs as well. That's right. Right. So that was different because we we had a different audience. Uh, and I think that had to all to do with uh, Shannon's love for uh, the ward singers. And he wanted to take mm -hmm. them on the same path because you couldn't sing with the 21st century singers unless you knew how to dance too. You okay. Sing and dance. Yes, they had choreography. That's right. That's right. That's good. Wow. Well, and that's interesting. Okay. And that helps me because there was something I did not know about them until I talked with them the other right. night. Everett was telling me that they had actually gotten airplay on secular stations with uh, the storm is passing over. Right. And I didn't, I didn't know that the person who introduced the storm is passing over is Charles Barnett. That's right. Charles that's okay. right. And so um, that's interesting. Do you know where the clubs nationally like were they traveling that uh, i went to local clubs in nashville tennessee i can remember on, on several occasions uh, and it was a time also when people were developing uh gospel clubs that's right they were very popular in the 70s that's they right they were very popular so I, I don't know what happened to that idea i think it's a great idea a great idea. The only person I know that really continued it here was actually a new life singer, um, Angie Prim, okay. uh, who went on, who she was part of the, the last incarnation of new life um, from like 85 to 93. She started a Christian light club okay. um, here called still waters. She kept it up for like a decade. Oh, interesting. Um, Very interesting. Acted out every time people loved it. And it was not yeah. preachy. It was not, you know, Right. Just entertainment. It was, it was just entertainment. entertainment. Yeah. You know, a lot of people like Evan Hawkins says that a lot of people are afraid to say that the music is also Christian entertainment. That's right. Yeah, and that's what they well, yeah. We got a lot of shaming around that, particularly Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure there always was, but I know in the nineties it got to be almost worrisome. Right. You know, we're not just we're not just here to entertain you, you know. Right, right. Why not? I kind of want to be entertained. We don't come for form and fashion. Right. <laughs> but we dressed up for you. Um, <laughs> so how did you get involved? Because you were gone then by the time they were working on Sunday Night. Right. right. How did I, that come? I, I had taught the song to them. Okay. And uh, evidently they liked it and wanted to put it on. And the, the tag, it ain't gonna rain no more, no more. It ain't gonna, the, that was placed on by uh, Charles and uh, Johnny. I mean, John, by um, Charles, cause he was playing. Okay. So, and I didn't play the session. Okay. Yeah. Got I it. just bought the song. Got it. And I was quite surprised to see that when the, when the record came out, they had uh, actually recorded it and played it. That's good. That's, That's good. right. When I, when I took it, uh, when I moved back to the metro area, East St. Louis, Illinois, um, I introduced it to uh, the, the um, O'Neill Twins Choir. Wow. I taught them the song. And okay. we performed it at Kiel, uh, Kiel Auditorium in the, I think it was like 70, 78. Um, that was the first time I met Ed, Ed Hawkins. And wow. all the same program, Evan Hawkins and the family, Walter Hawkins and, and the family, not the choir this time, uh, the twins. Uh, and I also want to say that Macy may have been on that program. As well. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So. Could you say, I'm, I'm also want to, because Lula is no longer with us. Right. So Lula. could you say some things about Lula? Lula was a... Uh, one thing about Lula, she was capable of getting along with everyone in the group. Okay. Uh, her personality um, lent itself to, to be very smooth and very an honest person. I think she was a nurse by trade. I'm not certain. Uh, but uh, she was a great alto singer. And she also had the look, you know, just like the, the look of o Odessa in the uh, Cleveland singers, mm -hmm. you know, the beautiful dress. And uh, she could always, she, she, she drew the men to the group. Okay. Because <laughs> you have to have some sex appeal. That's right. You have to have well. sex appeal. That's right. But if you look at gospel singers uh, in their totality, they were always great dressers. Yes. 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 
Well, I mean, we think back about all the groups that broke the tradition, the, the earlier groups of wearing the robes. Right. So you have the caravans and there when they transitioned out their dresses, yeah, right? beautiful the dresses, dresses and the ward yeah. singers and, um, you know, even and, the Davis and, sisters. And Clara would walk down that, uh, that aisle, that amazing grace table with that furrow for nothing. That's, <laughs> that's right. She has something in mind. I would love to see a coffee table book on gospel fashion. That would be interesting, very yeah. interesting. And particularly the see how how things change with those robes. You know, they went from the long to the puff sleeves to the color. That's what Helen was, Helen Stevens was known for those robes. Well, and she was and a, a whole assembly of robes. <sighs> and Father Hayes. Uh, absolutely. Lots of drapes. Well, and we can't leave out, you know, Pope. Well, you cannot. You can all the spiritualist churches. Period. 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 Can't leave them out. That's right. They um, have robe swag. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we'll call it: robe swag. I mean, Father uh, Hayes uh, Miter was no joke. Right. No, no, not not at all. And I and, and it has only been recently that I have really looked like unbelievable how long he's been singing and been yes. in that from Alabama, right? Well, and how many songs they how, picked up. How many songs? Right. Along the way. I mean, but, and he they, carried, but he carried on the tradition of that Maceo Woods. He took that Maceo which, Woods to a whole different level. That's right. A whole different level. That's right. Because Maceo was king. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, that just the I was listening to um, the evolution of Hello Sunshine. Right, I love. I'm going to redo that one. And so many people have, and it right. seems like it's never the same. Right, it, it's such a it's a uh, such a um, versatile song. Right, it goes. I mean, Aretha. Aretha recorded it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a she great song. Great song. And that's George George uh, Jordan. Yes. Who's, yes. Who, who doesn't get the credit that he really deserves? You know, people here, Jesus can work it out. They don't have a clue to who wrote it. Well, and again, how many people had cut it before it became a hit? Right. 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 I mean, the evolution of that song is really incredible to trace. All the way to hip hop. That's right. <laughs> That's right. All the way to the commercials. Um. I also, would, could you say some a few things about Charles Miller? Charles Miller was the 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 Isaac Hayes of the group. I mean Isaac Douglas of the group. That's right. He took it from from the stage to the floor. Yes. And he was determined to get everyone involved. And he had such a, a vibrant, a, a vivacious personality. You know, and full of jokes, and, and uh, just was a funny guy and a very talented guy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get the credit that he deserves.